This presentation is going to cover the alterations of renal and urinary tract function. There are five different topics that we'll cover. First, urinary tract obstructions, urinary tract infections, glomerular disease, acute kidney injury, and chronic kidney injury. First, we're going to talk about urinary tract obstructions that can be divided into two categories, upper tract and lower tract. But let's meet Joe. Joe's a 49-year-old with colicky pain to the right lower back, and he's experiencing hematuria, difficulty initiating and emptying his voids. He has a history of metabolic syndrome. Joe owns a pothole repair company, and because of this, when he works, he doesn't have access to clean restrooms. Right now, we're waiting for a CT scan without and with contrast. Now, urinary tract obstructions can interfere with the flow of urine, and it can interfere at any site along the urinary tract. The obstruction itself can be either anatomical or it could be a functional obstruction. And when the obstruction impedes the urine flow, it will increase the hydrostatic pressure, which will dilate the structures that are proximal to the obstruction. This increases the risk for infection. It compromises your overall renal function as well. And um, anatomic changes in your urinary system caused by obstruction, we call this obstructive uropathy. Now the severity of an obstructive uropathy is determined by five things. The location of the obstructive lesion, the involvement of one or maybe even both of the upper urinary tracts. So think about the ureters, the renal pelvis. Also, the completeness of the obstruction, the duration of the obstruction, and lastly, the nature of the obstruction or the cause. Obstructions can be relieved or at least partially alleviated with correction to the obstruction. Though permanent impairment happens with a complete or partial obstruction, it can worsen as it persists over weeks to months and can even be persisting longer than that. When one kidney is obstructed, the other kidney is able to compensate. Contralateral or unobstructed kidneys will then increase in size, especially in the individual glomeruli and the tubules as it's compensated from the obstructed kidney. In an upper urinary tract obstruction, the causes that can cause the obstruction are pretty common and they include stricture or maybe congenital compression of the area where the calyxes are or the ureter pelvic or ureter vesicle junctions. So think about in terms of what could lead to this obstruction. It may be a kidney stone or a calculi. It could be that there is ureteral compression from a nearby vessel, a tumor, even abdominal inflammation and scarring, something like a retroperitoneal fibroid. Ureteral blockage can also occur from kidney stones or if there's a malignancy of the renal pelvis or the ureter. This overall obstruction of the upper urinary tract will cause an increased hydrostatic pressure, will dilate the ureter, the renal pelvis, the calyces, and the renal parenchyma. That's proximal to the site of the blockage. And this increased pressure then is going to be transmitted to the glomerulus where now it will decrease your glomerular blood flow. Ultimately, we're going to have a decrease in GFR, or glomerular filtration rate. The dilation of the ureter, this is called a hydro ureter. And we have accumulation of urine in this ureter, which is causing the dilation. We can also have a dilation of the renal pelvis and the calyces that are proximal to where the blockage is, and this will lead to hydronephrosis, 
Hydronephrosis is an enlargement of the renal pelvis in the calyces, and it could be graded based on the severity of the enlargement. Or we can have ureterohydronephrosis, which is a combination of both, where the dilation of the ureter and the pelvis calyceal system are both enlarged. Once we have dilation of the upper urinary tract, this is just an early response to the obstruction. And what is occurring is that there's smooth muscle hypertrophy and accumulation of urine above the level of the blockage. We call this urinary stasis or even urinary retention. So unless we can remove this blockage, the obstruction, whether it's a kidney stone or anatomical um, pressure or malformation of the ureters or the kidneys, we will continue to have um, an increased risk for kidney, uh, decreased kidney function. And this dilation can further lead to enlargement with the interstitial areas causing apoptosis, affecting the nephrons, and can lead to chronic kidney disease. Kidney stones or renal calculi, we also refer to them as nephrolithiasis. These kidney stones or even urinary stones, urolithiasis, they are formed from crystals, proteins, and other substances that become masses. And this causes the urinary tract obstruction in most adults. These calculi or stones can be located not only in the kidneys, but also in the ureters and even in the bladder. Here in the US, approximately 9% of patients will suffer from a kidney stone. And it's more common among men, but women also can endure kidney stones as well. And once you've gotten a kidney stone, the recurrence rate is relatively high. Within the next 10 to 15 years of the patient's life, they're at a 30 to 40% uh, increase the risk of another kidney stone. The risk of urinary calculus formation or stone formation is influenced by many risk factors. The person's age, gender, sex, race, the geographical location in which they live, seasonal factors, the amount of fluid intake, their overall diet, their occupation, and there's also a genetic predisposition. Other factors include urinary tract infection, hypertension, atherosclerosis, metabolic syndrome, obesity, and type 2 diabetes. Most people will develop their first kidney stone before they're 50 years old. In terms of geographic location, the risk of stone formation does have indirect factors. It depends on the average temperature, humidity, the rainfall. These all can influence the kidney stone because it influences fluid intake and your dietary patterns. And so for those people who regularly consume and take in an adequate amount of water, those that are more physically active, they're gonna have a reduced risk of kidney stones compared to patients who are more inactive or they're consuming lower volumes of water altogether. Most of the time, kidney stones are going to occur unilaterally and they are a risk factor for chronic kidney disease. They also increase your risk for myocardial infarction. Kidney stones are classified according to the minerals that make up their stone. Kidney stone formation, or how renal calculi are formed, is complex. It is related to four different things. The first one is the supersaturation of one or more salts in the urine, the precipitation of salts from a liquid to a solid state, and we call this the crystallization, 
and also the growth through the crystallization or agglomeration. Sometimes this is called aggregation. And lastly, the effect of the stone inhibitors. Now supersaturation is a presence of where we have a higher concentration of salt within a fluid. In this case, it's going to be inside the urine. And the concentration of this is higher than the volume that's able to dissolve it and maintain this equilibrium. So then it clumps up together. And human urine contains positively and negatively charged ions that are capable of precipitating from a solution and forming these different types of salts. These salts eventually will form into crystals. They're retained and they grow into stones. Now crystallization, this is the actual process in where these salt crystals grow from a small nucleus to larger stones. And it's in the presence of supersaturated urine. Now supersaturation is essential for free stone formation. The urine needs to remain continuously supersaturated in order for the calculus to grow. Intermittent periods of supersaturation though, after ingestion of a meal or during times of dehydration, make it even more sufficient for the stone growth in many of our patients. Calcium phosphate stone formation is pretty rare and found at the end of the collecting duct. What is more common are calcium oxalate stones. The pH of urine has to also influence the risk of the precipitation and the stones from forming. When we have alkaline urine, which is considered to be a urine pH of over seven, this will significantly increase your risk of calcium phosphate stones. With acidic urine, a pH of under five, this will increase your risk of uric acid stones. In continuing the discussion about factors that affect stone formation, uh, we have not yet talked about the specific substances that are classified under the crystal growth inhibiting substances. And these are potassium citrate, pyrophosphate, and magnesium. And these substances are used to help our patients to um, deter their bodies from making further stones. This will actually help reduce calcium phosphate and calcium oxalate type stones. And these two type stones are the most common types of stones. They make up about 70 to 80% of all the stones requiring treatment. And actually the calcium oxalate make up the majority of that by far. And um, they're both genetic and environmental factors that increase the susceptibility for calcium type stones. Most affected individuals though do have idiopathic calcium oxalate urolithiasis. And this is just a fancy way of saying, we don't know why they got the stone in the first place. But these stones can form freely in supersaturated urine or they can even detach from interstitial sites of formation. These sites are called Randall plaques. Stones can also be made up of a struvite stones, um, specifically can also be made up of magnesium, ammonium, phosphate, and can be caused by protease, klebsiella, or pseudomonas. And so there can be a co-infection. So you'd have not only kidney stones, but you will also have a kidney infection or a urinary tract infection. Now struvite stones, they only make up about um, five to 10% of all kidney stones, um, but uh, they do have the tendency to affect women more often than they do affect men. And they grow these large branches, and we call them staghorn configurations. And they lodge into the renal pelvis and into the calyces. Now this non-staghorn calculi, they can be of all different sizes and they can be located in the calyces, also in the renal pelvis, but in other various sites along the ureter. Um, there are also other types of stone formation that you can see. 
we have stones called um, uric acid stones. And uric acid stones form in people that are constantly excessively excreting uric acid in the urine. For instance, a person that is diagnosed with gouty arthritis may have increased uric acid in their urine. And uric acid itself is primarily a byproduct of the biosynthesis of endogenous purines and it's secondarily affected by how much purines you're eating. Things that have purines in it, meat, beer, um, those are just some examples of how you would get purines in the diet. A consistently acidic urine will greatly increase your risk for a uric acid stone. Now we also have cysteine and xanthine, um, which are amino acids, and they can also precipitate readily in acidic urine as well. But these stones uh, usually are only causing about 1% of all the stones that are happening in your body. Hypercalciuria, which is a lot of calcium in your urine, and hyperoxaluria, lots of oxalate in your urine, are usually what is causing intestinal hyperabsorption and less commonly a defect in renal calcium reabsorption. However, hyperparathyroidism and bone demineralization associated with prolonged immobilization, also known to be causes for hypercalciuria as well. This is worth mentioning um, as we circle back to talking about the calcium stones for a minute, because those again are the most common stones. So you wanna understand how hyperparathyroidism can cause hypercalciuria, leading to an environment where you're more at risk for calcium type stones. So I wanna ask you now that we've discussed this slide for a second, you know, do you understand what the role of pyrophosphate, potassium citrate, and magnesium is in the formation of kidney stones? My next question for you is why is increasing citrus in your diet recommended for kidney stone patients who have calcium stones? Increasing citrus will increase the urinary citrate levels in your body. This inhibits the formation of the calcium-based kidney stones because it's gonna bind to calcium in the urine and if citrus binds to calcium in the urine, then it can't further crystallize and form calcium stones. It also will help to dissolve all the existing stones and it will prevent the stones that are already formed to become larger. Citrus fruits are very acidic in nature, but they have an alkalizing effect on your urine pH. Most of this information you're going to learn in more depth in your medical surgical class, but it is worth noticing and mentioning the different clinical manifestations, evaluation tools, and uh, baseline treatments. And with kidney stones, the main um, clinical symptom that you are going to hear with most patients is renal colic or pain. And this is moderate to severe type pain. And usually it's originating from the flank area, or we call this the posterior hypochondrium area. It radiates to the groin. And if it does radiate to this area, usually the obstruction is in the renal pelvis or the proximal ureter. If the pain is radiating to the lateral flank or the lower abdominal area, then we may suspect that the obstruction is in the mid ureter. And if it's even lower and we have more bothersome, what we call LUTs or lower urinary tract symptoms like urgency, frequency, 
um, and maybe even some urge con incontinence, then this could mean that the obstruction is in the lower ureter or in the ureterovesical junction or the UVJ. And the pain can become so severe and incapacitating that patients will um, show up in the urgent care or the emergency department and they need to have their pain relieved. Sometimes it's accompanied by nausea and vomiting as well. And you may even see gross and microscopic hematuria. A gross hematuria is when you can actually look and see the blood is visible. And microscopic hematuria is where you wouldn't be able to see it, but if you send your, uh, your analysis and um, you can actually even detect it on a, uh, a culture as well, is if there's three or more red blood cells per high powered microscopic field, then we would suspect that there is some blood. And um, I, I apologize, I don't mean a urinary culture, I meant your analysis, but you can order a separate uh, microscopic uh, RBC detection in the urine. The evaluation diagnosis of a kidney stone or calculi, it's really based on the symptoms of your patient. It's based on the history. So as long as you've done a thorough history of their um, previous um, stone history, Maybe they've had an episode before. Maybe they know what type of stone they've had before. Have they've had any type of surgeries or interventions? All of this is going to be pertinent information. In addition, you're going to get a baseline urinalysis and you want to include the pH because you want to see what the acidic environment is or the level of acidity. You may get a 24 hour urine, although this is not going to help identify um, anything in the moment, right? When it's an emergent situation, but the 24 hour urine, um, and you can use like a litho link, this is going to help detect what type of stone it is. Identify whether it's a calcium oxalate, calcium citrate, um, and what other significant constituents of the stone is part of the makeup. Additionally, we are able to analyze the stone itself and see if, um, there's you know, suggestions in terms of what changes we need to do or make in the diet. Now, some stones can be relieved by being passed spontaneously, and other times we have to intervene with more aggressive means like surgical intervention, laparoscopic surgery, or we might have to do an open surgery. And again, you can learn more about this in your med search class in detail. But we would ultimately find um, a reason to get an x-ray, although this is not always the best imaging. I find that ultrasound and CT are better, and sometimes you might even need an MRI. Pilogram is also a great way to detect uh, the stone location and areas of obstruction. The goal really is to inform your patient about the stone, the dietary changes they're gonna need to make, making sure that they're drinking at least two to three liters of water per day, and understanding how to manage their pain. So just among other things uh, that are going to be a little bit more extensive depending on what treatment option you give, these are the baseline uh, education that you are going to provide your patient. We also have neurogenic bladder, which is also affecting the lower urinary tract. And neurogenic bladder is just a general term for bladder dysfunction that's caused by a neurologic ideology. And it can involve issues with how much urine your bladder is actually able to store or how you void or the quality of voiding. And the types of dysfunction are related to the sites in the nervous system that are controlling these sensory and motor bladder functions. And lesions that develop in the upper motor neurons of the brain and spinal cord, they are going to result in dysinergia. Dysinergia is the loss of the coordinated neuromuscular contraction and overactive or hyperreflexive bladder function. However, lesions at the sacral area 
of the spinal cord or peripheral nerves will result in an underactivity or hypotonic. We call this a flaccid bladder. Often, we're also going to have a loss of bladder sensation as well when the lesions are at this lower area. And these neurological disorders develop above the pontine micturition center, which results in detrusor hyperreflexia. These are known as an inhibited or a reflex bladder. Okay, so these are the upper motor neurons. Um, this is when your bladder empties automatically, and as soon as it becomes full, the, um, it will empty. And the external sphincter still functions pretty normally. Because the pontine maturation center remains intact, there's coordination between your detrusor muscle contraction and the relaxation of the urethral sphincter. Stroke, TBI or traumatic brain injury, dementia, tumors of the brain, these are things that would result in this type of detrusor hyperreflexia, okay? Because these are disorders that develop above the pontine micturition center. But those that develop below the pontine micturition center, but it's above the sacral micturition center, so we're talking about the region of C2 and S1, and there are also upper motor neuron lesions, these are gonna result in detrusor hyperreflexia, but we're gonna have detrusor sphincter dysinergia. So there's a loss of the pontine coordination of the detrusor muscle contraction and the external sphincter relaxation. So in this case, both the bladder and the sphincter are contracting at the very same time. And this causes an, um, what we call bladder outlet uh, obstruction. And this is uh, going to be accompanied by diminished bladder relaxation during the storage time. And you're gonna just pee in very small volumes, but there's gonna be so much pressure inside the bladder, intravesicular bladder pressure. The overall result is an overactive bladder, and we call this overactive bladder syndrome. And your patients are gonna have urgency, frequency, urge incontinence, increased risk of urethral turbulence and urinary tract infection. Lesions that involve the sacral micturition center, so anything below S1, these are going to um, also be termed the quadra equina syndrome, and we're gonna talk more about this uh, in our neuro lecture. Um, so anything involving the sacral micturition center below or the peripheral nerve lesions, this is going to result in the opposite of what we had just talked about. Now we're talking about detrusor A reflexia. So there's going to be an A contractile detrusor. This is a lower motor neural disorder. And the result is that that detrusor muscle becomes um, unable to contract efficiently and the bladder is atonic. So with this situation, you're retaining urine, your bladder's distended because you're not able to release the void. Now, if the sensory innervation of the bladder is fully intact, then the a full bladder is going to be sensed by the detrusor, but it's not gonna be able to contract and release. This is underactive bladder syndrome because there's areflexia. Okay, so detrusor areflexia equals underactive bladder syndrome, where we just saw earlier that dysreflexia can often lead to overactive bladder syndrome. So this underactive bladder syndrome may have symptoms of stress, overflow incontinence. It may be accompanied by disorders like multiple sclerosis or other types of peripheral polyneuropathies all associated with this type of disorder. And because the bladder neck consists of circular smooth muscle with adrenergic uh, innervation, with overactive bladder syndrome and detrusor sphincter dysinergia, this can actually be managed by providing an alpha adrenergic blocking medication because we're trying to target the circular smooth muscle that's innervated by the adrenergic um, pathway. So if we give an, uh, a blocking or a blocker to the alpha adrenergic, this is also called an antimuscarinic, then we're able to block this pathway. Now, obstruction that's not adequately managed by 
pharmacotherapy or medication, this may require that something has to happen surgically to the bladder neck. And detrusor sphincter dyssynergia is managed also by intermittent catheterization in combination with these type of antimuscarinic medications. Because we're trying to prevent overactivity of the detrusor and the associated dyssynergia, but we're also trying to help the patient void regularly and make sure that they're emptying completely. Because if they don't, they are at higher risk again for bladder malfunctions, uh, urinary tract infections. With men that have dyssynergia, they may be managed by condom catheterization instead of intermittent catheterization. But many times we're promoting intermittent catheterization and we're talking about self-catheterization in this situation. When we talk about just overall urinary obstruction or obstruction to the lower urinary tract, we're talking about things that could cause urethral uh, strictures. So maybe they're scarring in the urethra and it uh, starts to scar inward. And so the uh, circumference of the urethra becomes smaller, making it very difficult to excrete urine. Prostate enlargement that happens with BPH or benign prostatic hyperplasia. This puts pressure on the urethra, uh, causing obstruction as well. And if there's any type of pelvic organ prolapse in our female patients, and that will also, these organs, as they bear down and, and push down towards the urethra, it can also cause obstruction. Other things that can cause partial obstruction um, is when your bladder wall compliance is very low. And so um, this all ties back into the types of uh, detrusor malfunctions that we've previously talked about. There are different types of incontinence that we should be aware of. There's urge, stress, overflow, functional, and mixed. And with urge incontinence, this is involuntary loss of urine that is associated with abrupt and strong desire to void. So you need to go pee really bad and very urgently. So we call this urinary urgency. And it's often associated with involuntary contractions of the detrusor, which we already defined as detrusor overactivity. When it's also associated with the neurologic disorder, we call this detrusor hyperreflexia, which we learned on the last slide. Now stress incontinence is when there's a loss of urine that's happening when there's some type of stress or pressure to the bladder, like during coughing, sneezing, laughing. Uh, sometimes it's even called giggle incontinence. And it can even happen with physical activity. I've had patients that would say, you know, if I sit down to a stand up position or stand up to a sit down position, it would also cause this type of incontinence because there's increased abdominal pressure with those movements. These are examples of stress incontinence. The, um, the weakening of the muscles will cause leakage. With overflow incontinence, this has to do with over distension of the bladder. Your bladder's full, 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 and you are not voiding before this happens. But also this can be associated with neurological lesions below S1. And it can also happen with urethral obstructions like an enlarged prostate. Functional incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine, and it's usually caused by dementia or immobility. You're not able to go and void when you need to, when you're supposed to. Uh, maybe you just don't have the capacity to know when you need to go, or because you're immobile or slow to get to the restroom, you're going to have this functional type of incontinence. And many patients have a mixed incontinence where there's going to be a combination of stress and urge incontinence together. Nocturnal enuresis is a term that we use to define nighttime bedwetting. And with nighttime bedwetting, it is more prevalent in children um, and older. We don't define nighttime bedwetting until they're over five years old. And it's about 20% of those patients. Boys are more likely to have nocturnal enuresis than girls by two to one ratio. 
but there are some adults that still experience this type of nighttime enuresis. And usually if you have nighttime enuresis in childhood, you also have some component of daytime enuresis as well. And without getting in too much detail with this, I do want you to know that constipation does have a, um, a component to this because and it becomes an increasing risk factor because of that pressure that is in the stool that overall stool burden tends to put pressure on the bladder and so when the child's sleeping um, and they don't have this awareness of their bladders full their body doesn't wake them up they're going to have a higher chance of wetting the bed also in childhood they may not be making enough adh hormone um, which is antidiuretic hormone and if they're not making enough ADH, then their urine is not being concentrated uh, to small volumes at night, like you and I, where this mechanism happens and occurs so that we don't have to wake up in the middle of the night to go pee all the time. But some children don't have ADH to the levels that help them do this, and so they're constantly filling up their bladder and it causes a functional type incontinence or an overflow type incontinence as well. We're gonna move on to the causes and types of urinary tract infection. Urinary tract infections are caused by bacteria and what you will have is inflammation of the urinary epithelium. And usually it's caused by bacteria from the gut flora. It can occur anywhere along the urinary tract, starting from your urethra, bladder, ureters, and kidney. And depending on where it is, is how we will determine a lower UTI and an upper UTI. Lower UTIs we defined as cystitis, and upper UTIs that occur in the kidneys, we will define that as pyelonephritis. And our patients that are at risk are typically premature newborns, prepubertal children, sexually active and pregnant women, women that are on antibiotics for whatever reason, but there's a disruption in vaginal flora due to the antibiotic therapy. If you use spermicides, if you are a postmenopausal woman that is estrogen deficient, you are at risk for urinary tract infection. Other things that could put you at risk are uh, if you are using indwelling catheters or you are self-cathing, um, particularly patients that have neurogenic bladder and if they need to do intermittent catheterization. Uh, also, our patients with diabetes, neurogenic bladder, which we just uh, talked about, and urinary tract obstructions, like with kidney stone or nephrolithiasis. Cystitis, however, is more common in women because of our anatomy. We have a shorter urethra and the proximity of the urethra to the anus. This increases the possibility of bacterial contamination. About 50% of women will have a form of lower UTI or cystitis at some point in their lifetime. Now, we also have uncomplicated versus complicated and recurrent. An uncomplicated UTI, this is generally going to be mild without any complications and it occurs in individuals with a normal urinary tract. Where a complicated UTI, or sometimes we call this a febrile UTI, this occurs when there is some type of abnormality in the urinary system, there's a health problem that compromises uh, immunity or host defenses. Think about HIV, renal transplant, diabetes, or even spinal cord injury as well. And they can occur alone, or they can occur in association with pyelonephritis, prostatitis, and kidney stones. 40% or more um, of cases of septic shock are actually caused first by urosepsis that presented in the emergency room and progress to overall septic shock. So this is an important tidbit to remember so that you can understand the severity of urinary tract infections. When we use the term recurrent UTI, this is commonly defined as someone that's had a urinary tract infection at least more than three times or three or more times within a 12 month period or two or more occurrences within a six month period. And it can even occur with a relapse or an over lapping uh, UTI. So when there's a second UTI caused by the same pathogen within the uh, next two weeks, or 
if there's a reinfection that occurred more than two weeks after the completion of the first treatment, and this could be with the same or a different pathogen, we would still call that a recurrent UTI. So let's further define then acute cystitis. Now, acute cystitis is inflammation of the bladder. It's the most common site of a UTI. And you will actually see morphologic changes in the bladder through cystoscopy. This is when you put a camera through the urethra and you can go in and look around the bladder wall. And with mild inflammation, the mucosa is gonna look very hyperemic or red. With more advanced cases of acute cystitis, you will actually see hemorrhaging diffusely, and we call this a hemorrhagic cystitis. Sometimes there's pus formation. Sometimes you can actually see exudates. Um, and if you did, we would call that suppurative cystitis. And we're just looking at the overall epithelial surface of the bladder for these changes. If someone has had a prolonged infection that hadn't been treated, this can eventually lead to sloughing of the bladder mucosa. And you will see ulcer uh, ulcerations in the bladder wall, and we call this ulcerative cystitis. But the most severe infections are going to cause necrosis of the bladder wall, and at that point, it's gangrenous cystitis. Acute pyelonephritis is an infection of one, but sometimes both upper urinary tracts, the ureter, the renal pelvis, and the kidney, um, specifically the interstitium. And there are some common causes that we've talked about. Usually it's anatomical issues. Sometimes it's because there is an obstruction like a kidney stone. Urinary obstruction and reflux of urine from the bladder. This is termed vesicle ureteral reflux. This is when the bladder uh, has urine, but the connections where the urethra, uh, the urethra, excuse me, the ureters are connecting to the uh, upper portions of the bladder are not secure and they will allow urine to reflux back upward and have this retrograde urine move up through the upper urinary tracts back into the kidneys. And this will put you at risk for acute pyelonephritis as well. But also if you have cystitis that wasn't treated and now the pathogen has been able to move upwards uh, with retrograde uh, urine or just have found a way to move up the um, the tissue, then you are going to be at risk for pyelonephritis as well. Chronic pyelonephritis, on the other hand, is when there's persistent or reoccurrent infection of the kidney. And eventually this is going to lead down to scarring of the kidney. And either one or both of the kidneys can be involved in chronic pyelonephritis as well. Sometimes the underlying Ideology of chronic pyelonephritis may not be known, and then we would call this idiopathic. But usually it's associated with someone that's had chronic urinary tract infection, someone with vesicle ureteral reflux, sometimes we call that VUR. They've had a history of stones or any other type of obstructive uropathy. Recurrent infections from acute pylo can also be associated with chronic pylo as well, like we mentioned before. Other things that can cause chronic pyelonephritis, drug toxicity from analgesics, such as taking NSAIDs, um, ischemia, irradiation, and having immune complex diseases can also put you more at risk for chronic pyelonephritis. The most common infecting microorganisms of urinary tract infections is E. coli by an astounding 80 to 85%. And the second most common is staphylococcus and about 10%. Now, less commonly are we going to see Klebsiella, Proteus, Pseudomonas, um, fungi, viruses, parasites, and even um, in some cases you might even see tubercular bacilli. And this is the same bacteria that causes TB. Most commonly, it's going to be E. coli. Uh, certain bacterial species actually enhances the virulence of um, each other. So they act together and they will form a biofilm that enhances colonization and it becomes more resistant uh, to your, your body's immune system and even resistant to antimicrobial therapy as well. Particularly, this happens with caudi or catheter-associated urinary tract infections. <laughs>
Painful bladder syndrome, or more commonly known as interstitial cystitis, is sometimes grouped up when we are talking about urinary tract infections. But actually, it is having urinary tract symptoms, specifically lower urinary tract symptoms or LUTs, but there is no infection. And these patients are going to experience an unpleasant sensation like pain, pressure, and discomfort, and they think it is related to UTI but there's no infection. The clinical manifestations that you are going to hear about are bladder fullness, feeling like um, they are able to pee, but there's just a little bit of volume that they have urinary frequency, often at night as well, and they're waking up in the middle of the night to pee. Patients would complain about chronic pelvic pain and symptoms that are lasting longer than six months of time. And the cause of interstitial cystitis or bladder uh, syndrome or painful bladder syndrome is really unknown. And we think it has an autoimmune reaction that's responsible for this inflammatory response that is setting off mast cell activation, altered epithelial permeability, and neuroinflammation. And with it, our patients will experience increased sensory nerve sensitivity, uh, sensitivity, and this is why they're constantly feeling this discomfort and pain. We think it also might have to do with the derangement of the, um, the glycoaminoglycan layer of the bladder mucosa itself, and it just makes it more susceptible to penetration by bacteria and noxious urinary solutes, but not necessarily causing a true urinary tract infection. Now, inflammation and fibrosis of the bladder wall are accompanied by um, hemorrhagic ulcers, that which we've talked about uh, before, which you would have to see using a cystoscopy. But this is only happening in some individuals. The bladder volume may also decrease because of the fibrosis, and this is why they're just feeling like they can't empty well or there's only a little bit of pee. Most of the time, this is happening with our older patients that have interstitial cystitis. There's also some protein involvement, um, anti-proliferative factor, which is a protein expressed by the bladder uroepithelium in patients with interstitial cystitis. And sometimes we can actually use this as a biomarker to diagnose interstitial cystitis, but many times it's not needed. With good uh, history, and ruling out urinary tract infections and other reasons why someone may have interstitial cystitis or these, excuse me, these lower urinary tract uh, symptoms will lead us to the conclusion that they have interstitial cystitis. Now this chronic pain can actually lead to sleep deprivation, which also can be compounded by depression. And these patients are very, very uncomfortable. And they've probably already tried antibiotics because somebody thought that maybe it was an infection and it wasn't. And then they've um, had some improvement, but then it comes back again and there's still no positive urinary uh, culture that shows bacteria. Again, leading to the overall conclusion that it may be interstitial cystitis. So good history, good physical exam, getting your analysis and uh, cystoscopy, so actually taking a camera in through the urethra and looking at the bladder to see if there's any other possible diagnoses. And there's not really any single treatment that's effective right now, but there are some oral and intravascular therapy, so we actually put it inside the bladder. Botox can also be used, um, which can help uh, relax the bladder a little bit, and it's used for symptom relief, but it's not to completely heal the interstitial cystitis or cure the interstitial cystitis. In some cases, surgery is needed for refractory cases that are just not getting better, but are also getting worse. This is a chronic illness. And many times patients with interstitial cystitis or painful bladder syndrome also are experiencing fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, chronic fatigue syndrome, Sjogren syndrome, and they may also have chronic headaches and um, vulvodynia, which is a uh, pain or discomfort in the vulva area. More commonly, it's going to be affecting women ages 20 to 40 years old. Again, these symptoms are going to be in the absence of infection and uh, there will be no identifiable cause.
Let's now meet Emma, who is an 88-year-old woman with a history of recurrent urinary tract infections and kidney stones. She passed her last stone two weeks ago, and it was a very painful situation. The last time she had a urinary tract infection was three months ago. It took two rounds of antibiotics to fix the problem, she says. Her daughter brings her in into the ED because she's not acting like herself. And she wants to know why she keeps getting the stones and the UTIs despite taking antibiotics. So this type of patient, it's very classic that her provider has put her on some type of prophylactic antibiotic because she has these recurrent stones and she has recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, Just as a side note, a prophylactic antibiotic is an antibiotic that we're giving at a lower dose, usually it's half the strength, and they're taking it every day until um, the provider feels like they're at a lower risk. And so sometimes this can be um, three to six months at a time. And we are just using it to provide coverage to deter bacteria from um, accumulating and colonizing and causing infection. With this patient, what stands out to me is that she's not acting like herself. Many times with our older patients that are experiencing urinary tract infection, the clinical manifestations aren't gonna match up with our usual um, and expected manifestations. The LUTs, the lower urinary tract symptoms, like the urinary urgency, frequency, dysuria, hematuria. They may have none of that and it becomes a little, hard to distinguish what's going on so they can be completely asymptomatic but have an underlying urinary tract infection and then the first things that you're going to notice are confusion or they're just going to have very poorly localized abdominal comfort okay so this is an important thing to distinguish between our older patients their cystitis may demonstrate very vague symptoms and again be overall asymptomatic. Now we're going to pivot and talk about glomerular diseases. First, we're going to talk about the acute and chronic glomerular nephritis, and we're going to talk about nephrotic and nephritic syndromes. Glomerulonephritis is inflammation to the glomerulus. And with acute glomerulonephritis, we have primary and secondary. Primary glomerulo injuries can be caused by uh, viral illnesses, systemic diseases, vascular disorders, uh, drugs or toxins, but most commonly it's an immunologic abnormality. Secondarily, we would have diabetes, lupus, congestive heart failure, and HIV causing secondary glomerulonephritis. And really, this is significant because glomerulo diseases cause chronic kidney disease and eventually end stage renal failure. And this is an occurrence worldwide. With glomerulonephritis, immune mechanisms are the major cause of injury for both primary and secondary causes. And the injury is damaging the glomerulocapillary filtration membrane, which includes the endothelium, the basement membrane, and the epithelium. And the most common types of injury are going to be the type 2 and type 3 and type 4 hypersensitivity reactions. Now, there are different causes of injury, and they can result in more than one type of glomerular lesion, but they aren't necessarily disease-specific. So what causes this immune injury to occur in the first place? The activation of the biochemical mediators of inflammation. So remember, our complements, our cytokines and leukocytes, they're all going to be involved in this antigen antibody complex and they'll be deposited or formed in the glomerular capillary wall. The complement can be deposited with the antibodies and activation can cause cell lysis to occur. And this really serves as a chemotactic stimulus. Remember that chemotactic means it's gonna attract more and it's attracting the neutrophils, the monocytes, the T lymphocytes. These phagocytes with the activated platelets 
they're going to further injure this basement membrane and cause inflammatory reaction mediators to injure the glomerular filtration membrane, again, the epithelial and the endothelial cells. This injury will increase glomerular membrane permeability and reduce the glomerular membrane surface area. There's going to be swelling and proliferation of the mesangial cells, which will expand the extracellular matrix in the Bowman spaces of the glomerula. This will contribute to a crescent formation. When there is the deposition of these substances in the Bowman space, it forms and shapes this crescent moon. The result overall is going to be decreased glomerular blood flow, hypoxic injury, decreased driving hydrostatic pressure, overall decreased GFR and increased serum creatinine levels. There's a type of acute glomerulonephritis called MPGN, membranal proliferative glomerulonephritis. And it is an idiopathic pattern of glomerulo injury. Proliferation of the mesangial cells and these formation of the crescents in the Bowman capsules also are involved with the deposition of complement, specifically the C3 complement. There's also going to be inflammatory injury to MPGN. This is a rare disorder and it's associated with autoimmune disease, also infections like hepatitis B and hep C, and we also know that there is a way to actually see whether this patient has MPGN. There are three stains that can help us to understand if there is a MPGN pathology. And this can be differentiated by light microscop uh, microscopy. And so these stains will be positive for the complement component of C3. Now injury to the glomerulocapillary wall occurs with all types of membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. And what this will cause is proteinuria, hematuria, nephrotic syndrome, and acute or chronic failure. The onset of this disease can be sudden or it can be insidious and there is going to be significant loss of the nephron function that occurs before even the symptoms develop. So many times uh, you are going to see changes physiologically before the symptoms manifest to a point where your patient will be able to describe any signs and symptoms. It can be silent, mild, moderate, or even severe in that symptom presentation. There's not really a specific clinical sign which makes it really difficult to diagnose. And with severe or progressive glomerular disease, it will cause oliguria. This is a term that we use to describe when urine output is less than 30 milliliters every hour. It will also cause hypertension and renal failure. These local lesions tend to produce less clinical symptoms. Salt and water are reabsorbed, which will contribute to uh, volume expansion, edema, weight gain, and hypertension. There are two major symptoms of the more severe forms of glomerulonephritis. The first one is proteinuria, which exceeds three to five grams a day with albumin. This is also called macroalbuminuria. Also, hematuria with red blood cell casts. With nephrotic syndrome associated with gross proteinuria and lipid sediments, it will be associated to this more severe form of glomerulonephritis. Nephrotic syndrome is more defined on the next slide and you want to be able to differentiate it between nephritic syndrome. Nephritic syndrome is associated with red blood cells escaping through the glomerular membrane producing a smoky brown tinged urine. You'll also see red blood cell casts and 
accompanying proteinuria. The bleeding that happens in the glomerulus provides prolonged contact with acidic urine, and this together will transform the hemoglobin to the methemoglobin form. This is going to be brownish in color and no clots. To compare this, if there's bleeding from sites that are lower in the urinary tract system, you're going to see more of a pink or red colored urine. The sediment of chronic glomerular disease is a granular cast, waxy cast, and there's going to be less protein and blood than you would find in the urine sediment in nephrotic or nephritic syndromes. My question is what is damaging the epithelial cells that can actually result in proteinuria? We have activated complement inflammatory cytokines, there's oxidants, proteases, and growth factors that are all attacking this epithelial cell layer, which will alter the membrane of permeability, which allows protein to move into the urine where it's not supposed to.
Nephrotic syndrome can be defined as excretion of 3.5 grams or more protein in the urine every single day. And you'll also see characteristic glomerular injury and occurs when the filtration of proteins will exceed the tubular reabsorption. The primary causes of nephrotic syndrome include the minimal change disease, which is called the lipoid nephrosis, membranous glomerulonephritis, which we talked about earlier, and focal segmented glomerulosclerosis. There are some secondary forms of nephrotic syndrome that occur in systemic diseases like diabetes, amyloidosis, uh, lupus, and with uh, IgA vasculitis. This is sometimes called hinoch scholin purpura. Nephrotic syndrome is also associated with certain drugs like NSAIDs, and um, it can also be caused by infections, malignancies, and other vascular disorders. It often signifies a more serious prognosis when there are secondary complications to this proteinuria. It's more common in children than in adults, but in adults, it's more commonly because of an idiopathic ideology. With nephritic syndrome, you're more likely to see hematuria and red blood cell casts in the urine. You may see some proteinuria, but it's gonna be less severe than what we would see in nephrotic syndrome. Remember, with nephrotic syndrome, it's at least 3.5 grams per day. And what you're seeing here with the proteinuria that occurs in nephritic syndrome, it's really related to the infiltration of the inflammatory cells in the mesangium that's driven by the antigen deposition that's damaging the endothelial cells. It's gonna allow the escape of red blood cells and protein. Often, when we have glomerulonephritis that is infection related, like for hep B, hep C, uh, acute post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is a type of glomerulonephritis that will occur after a patient has had a strep infection like strep throat. Secondary thing to look for after a patient has strep throat. It can also occur with rapidly progressing uh, crescentic glomerulonephritis. Remember, that's the one where you have those crescents building up in the Bowman capsule and also with lupus nephritis. This chart is provided on this slide so that you can see an, a side-by-side -side comparison of nephrotic and nephritic syndrome. However, you may have to look in your textbook as well to follow along or your slides so that you are able to read this a little bit more clearly. I'm just going to go over quickly uh, some of the common associated disease processes with nephrotic and nephritic syndrome and the underlying pathophysiology. This all should be a review of the previous slides. We're going to start from the bottom. This is associated with nephrotic syndrome, chronic glomerulonephritis. Remembering that nephrotic syndrome has to do with proteinuria of at least 3.5 grams or more, and it can be a consequence of any type of glomerulonephritis. However, it's more common with the crescentic and the progressive glomerulonephritis. What you're going to see pathophysiologically is glomerulofibrosis and scarring. We're going to have interstitial and tubular fibrosis, as well as vascular sclerosis. The original lesions might not be definable, but all in all, it's going to progress to end-stage kidney disease. With membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis, remember this is usually idiopathic and associated to low complement levels. There will be mesangial cell proliferation, thickening of that basement membrane, sub endothelial deposits of immune complexes, which are going to occlude the glomerulocapillary blood flow it will overall decrease your GFR. This again is another type of glomerulonephritis that's gonna be associated with nephrotic syndrome. With nephritic syndrome, where you're more likely to see hematuria than you are proteinuria, and if you do see proteinuria, it's gonna be less than you would see with nephrotic syndrome. An example of glomerulonephritis that's associated with nephritic syndrome is the type that has to do with the IgA nephropathy. In this type, you're going to see 
deposits of immune complexes in the mesangium, and you're going to see mesangial proliferation. This will also decrease your GFR, but it will decrease your blood flow as well. Lastly, there was a type of glomerulonephritis that I alluded to that occurs or could occur after a patient has a strep infection like strep throat. Acute post-infectious or infection-related glomerulonephritis, usually it's a group A beta hemolytic streptococcus or staphylococcus, we are going to see diffuse deposits of the immune complexes, IgG and complement, in the glomerulocapillary walls. There's going to be infiltration of leukocytes because of the infection, endocapillary proliferation and mesangial proliferation. This will lead to decreased capillary blood flow and GFR as well. And then you can see the other types here and, and review along with your textbook. We're moving now to another section of this presentation that will review acute kidney injury and chronic kidney injury. First, we're going to talk about acute kidney injury, which is the sudden decline in kidney function. You're going to have decreased glomerular filtration and a decreased urine output. There's going to be accumulation of nitrogenous waste products in the blood. And you're going to see this demonstrated by elevation in the plasma creatinine and the BUN or blood urea nitrogen levels. And it affects about 5% of hospitalized individuals. There's a higher percentage in the ICU and there's a mortality rate of 50 to 80% for patients that are diagnosed with AKI. Generally, renal insufficiency is going to refer to a decline in renal function to about 25% of what was normal, or a GFR of 25 to 30 mLs per minute. The levels of serum creatinine and urea are going to be mildly elevated. This term, acute kidney injury, really comes from a more preferred term for acute renal failure because it's capturing the diverse nature of the syndrome itself because it can range from just very minimal or very subtle changes to the kidney and renal function but also to complete renal failure if there is no intervention and often uh, complete renal failure requiring renal replacement therapy. Renal, refa uh, renal failure, this terminology, refers to the significant loss of renal function. When there is less than 10% of renal function that's remaining, this is when we will move to the threshold of calling it end-stage kidney disease, or ESKD. Sometimes this is also called end-stage renal failure, ESRF. Please be able to di differentiate the decline in renal function. Again, renal insufficiency is 25% decrease and end-stage is 10% decrease. Now creatinine is uh, constantly being released from our muscles and primarily it's going to be excreted by glomerular filtration and as our GFR declines when we have chronic kidney disease, the serum creatinine level in our blood is also going to increase by a reciprocal amount because it needs to maintain a constant rate of excretion. No significant tubular adjustment occurs for our creatinine. The serum creatinine levels continue to increase even though our GFR is decreasing. And the measures of plasma creatinine can serve as an index of changing glomerular function. But serum creatinine as an estimate of GFR is kind of a limited study or limited lab. When there's reduced muscle mass or fluid overload, we can't really tell if this elevation in, in serum creatinine is because of this or is it because of a, a kidney function. The equations including cysteine C are, or uh, combined with uh, serum creatinine will actually provide us a better index of what's really going on. 
also we can get the clearance of urea and watch for the patterns that are similar to that of creatinine. But urea is also filtered as well as absorbed in various states of hydration. So it is also not a good index for our glomerular filtration rate. However, as our GFR decreases, the plasma urea concentration will also increase. The concentration of urea, nitrogen, and blood, or blood urea nitrogen, BUN, it reflects glomerular filtration and urine concentration capacity. Urea is filtered at the glomerulus. So the BUN levels increase as glomerular filtration drops. There's an inverse relationship. Because urea is reabsorbed by the blood through the permeable tubules, the BUN value is going to increase in states of dehydration. They also increase with acute and chronic renal failure when the passage of fluid through the tubules is slowed. BUN will vary as a result of altered protein intake as well and alternations in protein catabolism. So for this reason, it's also a poor measure of glomerular filtration rate. Urea is a waste product that's formed in the liver when our protein is being metabolized into amino acids. This process is going to produce ammonia, which is converted into a less toxic waste product in our body called urea. Then this urea is released by the liver into the blood and carried to the kidneys where it's going to be filtered out and released into the urine. Since this is an ongoing process, there's usually a small amount of urea nitrogen in the blood. So even though the B is in front of the UN, really we're measuring the urea and the nitrogen in the blood. We're not measuring blood itself. The normal values can range from 10 to 20 milligrams per deciliter of blood, depending on the lab that is providing this information. BUN to creatinine ratio is another lab value that we will look at with acute kidney injury and chronic kidney injury. The ratios of BUN to plasma creatinine concentration are fractional excretions of sodium, and this ratio of filtered sodium to the excreted sodium. These are helpful to allow us to reflect on what is happening in the renal tubular reabsorption. When we have a patient that is in pre-renal AKI, the tubular function is maintained and salt, water, and urea will be reabsorbed. With acute tubular um, nephrosis, the reabsorption and urinary concentration will be compromised. Other causes of renal failure can exist similar to the clinical findings. Cysteine C, a serum protein that's constantly produced by nucleated cells, can be freely filtered by the glomerulus and these concentrations can serve as a measure of how the GFR is um, reacting and this may be useful for providers to detect early changes in the glomerular filtration rate. You may choose to get serial measurements meaning you'll continue to measure this ratio over time. Serial measurements of this plasma creatinine concentration will provide an index of renal function when the patient is in the recovery phase of AKI. Changes in serum creatinine level only occur if there's more than a 50% change of glomerular filtration that's lost. And often, you're gonna see this change delayed for about 24 hours. We can't have these diagnostic delays because we're not able to implement therapy in a timely manner, and it makes the choices of medical care very difficult. It also contributes to disease progression and mortality.
So right now in um, research, there are advances being made for other biomarkers to help providers see these changes in kidney injury much faster and allow us to estimate renal function much faster. And you can read about these in the textbook under biomarkers in kidney injury. The ratio of BUN to creatinine is usually 10 to 1 and 20 to 1. When you have an increased ratio, this can be due to a condition that's causing a decrease in the flow of blood to the kidneys. The next two slides are going to be really important in understanding the difference between pre-renal, intra-renal, and post-renal acute kidney injury. And it has to do with at what level is this injury occurring? Is it before the kidney, within the kidney, like intrinsic, or after the kidney? Okay, and if you think about it anatomically, it may make more sense to you. The pre-renal causes are the most common cause of acute renal failure. And most often it's because of impaired renal blood flow. So you have to ask yourself, what can cause impaired renal blood flow? Things like fluid loss that happens with burns, hemorrhaging, sepsis, if you don't have enough cardiac output that can happen with an MI, a patient that has multiple organ dysfunction, or renal vasoconstriction. Did you know that renal vasoconstriction can be caused by using NSAIDs or even radio contrast that we use for, or more, um, recognizable term is contrast dye that we use for CTs. This can cause renal vasoconstriction. Patients with renal artery stenosis or edema in the kidney, this will restrict arterial blood flow. And during the early phases of this hypoperfusion or low perfusion, we do have protective autoregulatory mechanisms that will help maintain our GFR. Particularly, these are gonna be mediated by angiotensin II, which will cause dilation and vasoconstriction of the afferent arterioles and the efferent arterioles. So with the afferent arterioles, we're going to have dilation. With the efferent arterioles, we're gonna have vasoconstriction. We also have tubular glomerular feedback mechanisms that will help maintain GFR and the distal tubular nephron flow. Ultimately, GFR is going to decline because there's a decrease in filtration pressure. In critical care units like the ICU, sepsis, septic shock, cardiogenic shock that follows some type of cardiac surgery, they're the most common causes of AKI. You also can have AKI during chronic kidney failure as well because maybe there's a sudden stress or a sudden disease process that imposes itself even on a kidney that has minimal functioning already and this will progress to end-stage kidney disease shortly after. Especially if we do not uh, restore blood volume or blood pressure and deliver oxygen, this is going to cause cell injury and acute tubular necrosis. It can cause apoptosis and acute interstitial necrosis as well. These are going to lead to more severe forms of AKI. Now with the intrarenal, also called intrinsic because it's within the kidney, this can result from ischemic acute tubular necrosis. It can also be caused by nephrotoxic ATN. With nephrotoxic ATN, you have to think of things like antibiotics or drugs that have insulted the kidney, or again, contrast dye that we use for CTs and scans. Acute glomerulonephritis can also cause intrarenal AKI because again, the glomeruli lie within inside the kidney. Vascular diseases like malignant hypertension Disseminated intravascular coagulation and renal vasculitis can also affect the kidney and cause intrarenal damage. Allograft rejection, interstitial diseases like drug allergies, infections, and tumor growth all can be um, disease processes that lead to intrarenal acute kidney injury. ATN or acute tubular necrosis 
caused by ischemia, this is the most common cause of interrenal AKI. And most often we're gonna see it following surgery and with severe sepsis. The term acute tubular necrosis is sometimes used interchangeably with AKI, but that's not the case. You can have AKI without ATN, as you can see with pre-renal and post-renal. But patients with ATN, this is generally described as post-ischemic or nephrotoxic AKI, they will have AKI. Okay, so again, someone with AKI doesn't necessarily have to have ATN, but ATN is a cause of AKI. Oliguria is a common sign of interrenal AKI. This is urine output that is less than 30 mLs per hour. Now, it doesn't mean that your patient has to pee exactly 30 mLs an hour or more, but cumulatively over a 24 hour period, you're trying to average this 30 mLs per hour. Or it could mean for several hours, they are not producing urine up to this level. Anuria is rare. Anuria is a term that we use when there's no urine whatsoever. The creatinine values in septic renal injury may not reflect renal injury. Why? Because sepsis decreases the production of creatinine. And you'll see this with changes of hematocrit level also, and it's reflective of the amount of extracellular fluid as well. So we can't really base it on creatinine. However, creatinine levels usually increase with decreased renal blood flow and decreased GFR, which we know from previous slides. In sepsis-induced AKI, the creatinine values remain within a normal range, and it could be related to alterations in the intrarenal microcirculatory blood flow that's different from the kidney ischemia that developed related to systemic hypotension and hypoperfusion of a non-septic AKI. So we have to be very careful in interpreting these creatinine levels because they're going to be different depending on if it was sepsis induced or non-sepsis induced. Sepsis related tubular injury occurs in the absence of hypoperfusion and can be related just to inflammation and changes within the microcirculation as well as mitochondrial function of the kidney. Now, with post renal acute kidney injury, this is often rare and it usually occurs when there is a urinary tract obstruction that is now affecting the kidneys bilaterally. If it's only affecting one kidney, then we have the other kidney to compensate. But when it's happening bilaterally, it can put someone into a post renal acute kidney injury. Also, if there is bilateral ureteral obstruction, if there's bladder outlet obstruction like prostatic hypertrophy, BPH, a tumor, neurogenic bladder, or urethral obstruction can cause post renal acute kidney injury. Remember that the urinary system, with starting with the uh, urethra, the bladder and the ureters are all after the kidney. So this is post-renal acute kidney injury. The obstruction can cause an increase in the interluminal pressure upstream from the site of the obstruction. This should make sense. Wherever that stone is lodged or whatever there is an obstruction, then the pressure above is going to increase. And therefore, there's going to be a gradual decrease in GFR. With this, you may see several hours of anuria, meaning no urine at all. Patients will complain of flank pain. They also may have polyuria, which is a characteristic finding as well. This type of AKI can occur even after diagnostic catheterization. So the procedures that we use to um, better see the urinary tract, sometimes we will introduce a catheter and dye into 
uh, the bladder and the ureters to light it up and so that we're able to see where the obstruction is or where the stone is or if there's reflux. Well, this can actually cause post-renal acute kidney injury. This slide here is provided with the same information, a little bit more detailed, but I do want you just to kind of think anatomically why and where pre-renal, intrarenal, and post-renal AKI occurs. And you may be asked to identify, for instance, you know, if someone has glomerulonephritis that leads to AKI, AKI what type of AKI is it? Intrarenal, pre-renal, post-renal. If someone has interstitial disease, is it intrarenal, pre-renal, post-renal? If someone has sepsis, pre-renal, intrarenal, post-renal. So go through and be able to differentiate. Now those are the types of AKI, but now we're gonna talk about the phases of AKI and the clinical progression in which AKI happens. It occurs in phases. First, we have the initiation phase, the extension phase, maintenance phase, and the recovery phase. In the initiation phase, there's going to be reduced perfusion or toxicity where the renal injury is just evolving, and it usually lasts about 24 to 36 hours. During this phase, we can actually prevent further injury from happening. When we progress to the extension phase, there's going to be progressive ischemia, infiltration of inflammatory cells, mostly the neutrophils. We'll have releases of cytokine inflammation and cell injury. The maintenance, also referred to as the oliguric phase, is where there's going to be established renal injury and dysfunction. After the initiating event has happened and been resolved, but still you're going to see symptoms from this. What are you going to see and how long? These symptoms can last weeks to months. You might see a decrease in urine output and it's the lowest during this phase. This is why it's also called the oliguric phase. We're going to see changes in serum creatinine, BUN, serum potassium levels will increase. Metabolic acidosis can develop and there's going to be a salt and a water overload during this phase. In the recovery phase, this is the interval where renal injury has been repaired and we're finally getting to normal renal function. Your GFR is going to return to normal levels, but the regenerating tubules can't concentrate the filtrate correctly quite yet. So in this phase, diuresis is pretty common. You're going to see a decline in serum creatinine, decline in BUN, and an increase in your creatinine clearance. You also might see polyuria as a result of excessive loss of electrolytes like sodium and potassium, as well as water. Polyuria is when you have to pee a lot. Fluid and electrolyte balances are going to require careful maintenance in this phase. We're gonna to transition to our last topic now. Following AKI, we're gonna talk about chronic kidney disease. We'll be discussing lab values and other ways to determine what stage of kidney disease they're in and the signs, the symptoms, and the clinical manifestations. We understand that GFR, or glomerular filtration rate, measures how effective our kidneys are. Our kidneys are supposed to be filter, uh, filtering waste products from the blood and producing urine. The glomeruli are very tiny filtering units in the kidneys that are responsible for filtering the blood, removing the waste, any excess fluid, and electrolytes. The GFR is a very crucial indicator of kidney function and it's used to assess and monitor a patient's overall kidney health. It's influenced by various things like blood pressure, the blood flow to the kidneys, and the health of these glomeruli filtering units.
When a patient has a decline in GFR, this can be an early sign that there is kidney dysfunction or kidney disease. And you can see this chart here that describes the stages of chronic kidney disease based on the kidney function. At stage one, the kidney damage has occurred, but there's still normal kidney function. You're going to have a GFR of 90 or more. It will then progress downward and downward and downward to eventually we get to stage five, which is kidney failure, and we have a loss of a GFR and less than 15 to 10 percent of overall kidney function. Pay attention to the levels of GFR because this is going to again help you to determine what stage you are in. Now there are going to be some lab values that are going to be a little bit different between labs but typically this is pretty uh, tight in terms of the range. Chronic kidney disease is the progressive loss of renal function and it's associated to many different systemic diseases that affect all the organ systems. Diseases like hypertension, lupus, intrinsic kidney disease. We also have acute kidney injury, chronic glomerulonephritis, chronic pyelonephritis, obstructive uropathies, vascular disorders. These all can contribute to chronic kidney disease. But the most significant risk factor is diabetes mellitus. And we have guidelines that help us define the stages of CKD or chronic kidney disease that our patient is in. And it's based on the estimates of their glomerulofiltration rate or GFR. We also can use the albumin in the urine to determine what stage they are in as well. And this term chronic kidney disease is the preferred terminology because it's referencing a declining GFR. The term renal insufficiency and chronic renal failure are still kind of used and sometimes they are used interchangeably, but they're more used to describe declining renal function, but they don't have a specificity of the stages that are recommended. So we use chronic kidney disease, CKD, and the stages. CKD decreases the filtration and the tubular functions, so the consequences are going to be manifested throughout all the organ systems. We have stage 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, or we can say normal, mild, moderate, severe, or end-stage GFR function. And with this comes either hypertension, mild hypertension, moderate hypertension, or severe hypertension, respectively. So let's go through the stages now. In stage one chronic kidney disorder or disease, the normal GFR is going to define the first stage, a GFR over 90. And usually the progression is um, not apparent at this point and the only symptoms that you might see are some mild hypertension. With stage 2 or mild CKD, this is a GFR between 60 to 89 and you are going to see a mild increase of kidney damage and you'll see early signs of bone disease, an increase in the pituitary hormone, increasing plasma creatinine levels and increasing urea. There could be some subtle hypertension as the main symptom. In moderate or stage three chronic kidney disease, which is a GFR between 30 and 59, you will see urethropoietin deficiency, anemia, and there will be an increased plasma creatinine in urea at levels higher than previous. You will also see mild hypertension. In stage four, which is defined by a GFR of 15 to 29, and also this can be considered severe CKD, we are seeing an increase in the patient's triglyceride levels, metabolic acidosis, hyperkalemia, salt and water retention, 
increasing plasma, creatinine, and urea above the levels previously. It's very common we're going to see moderate hypertension, hyperphosphatemia, and anemia in this stage. A patient progresses to end-stage kidney disease once they have a GFR of less than 15, and you are going to see uremia in this stage. We're also going to have severe hypertension, severe hyperphosphatemia, and anemia in this stage. Proteinuria and uremia are going to occur due to glomerular hyperfiltration, and we're going to have damages to the interstitial tissue of the kidney because of inflammation. Uremia is a pro-inflammatory state, and it is in the presence of many systemic things that are occurring. The effects that you're going to see overall, it's called uremic syndrome, and it's associated with this accumulation of urea and other nitrogenous compounds and toxins. The toxins include accumulation of the end products of the uh, protein metabolism that we talked about earlier. There will also be alterations in the patient's fluid and electrolytes, metabolic acidosis, intestinal absorption of these toxins produced by gut bacteria, and the results of altered renal hormone synthesis, which will lead to the anemia, hyperphosphatemia, and hypocalcemia that we see in correlation to uremia. With uremic syndrome, we're also going to see hypertension, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, constipation, malnutrition, and weight loss, puritis, edema, anemia, neurologic cardiovascular disease, and skeletal changes. So you can see here that it is very um, uh, systematic and many organs and body systems are involved. With creatinine and urea clearance, we are going to see constant release of creatinine from our muscles and excreted primarily by glomerular filtration. And as your GFR declines in CKD, the serum creatinine levels are going to increase by reciprocal amounts because it's going to maintain a constant rate of excretion. But because there's no significant tubular adjustment that occurs for creatinine, the serum creatinine levels are going to continue to increase as your GFR decreases. There's going to be an inverse relationship. So when we measure plasma creatinine, it can help us to kind of understand the change in glomerular function. It just serves as an index, but serum creatinine is just an estimate of GFR and it's limited because if there's reduced muscle mass or fluid overload, it will change the values of serum creatinine. We also know that equations including cystatin C or combined with serum creatinine will actually provide a better index. So when we take cystatin C and serum creatinine together, it gives us more of an index. However, GFR is going to be the ultimate indicator. If you want to know more about new biomarkers that help us to understand kidney injury, there's a little excerpt in your textbook, but also you can do some research online that talks about the biomarkers for chronic kidney disease. Now the clearance of urea follows a pattern that's very similar to creatinine. However, urea is filtered and absorbed and reabsorbed, and this rate of reabsorption and filtering will vary with the state of your patient's hydration status. And because of that, it's not a good index of GFR as well. However, as your GFR decreases, your plasma urea concentration also increases. So they have a, um, a relationship where it moves together. There will be fluid and electrolyte imbalances as well as acid base imbalances and these things are significantly disturbed with chronic kidney disease sodium and water balance is going to change in chronic renal failure you will have a, a situation of sodium load that is delivered 
to the nephrons, but it's going to exceed what is usually normally delivered there. So excretion has to increase. Therefore, less sodium will be reabsorbed. This is going to lead to sodium deficits and volume depletion. And as your GFR is reduced, the ability to concentrate and dilute urine will also diminish. The potassium balance is also something to consider as well. In chronic renal failure, tubular secretion of potassium increases until oliguria develops. So your patient's making less than 30 ml of urine an hour. The use of potassium sparing diuretics may also precipitate elevated serum potassium levels, causing hyperkalemia. And as the disease progresses, the total body potassium levels rise to very life-threatening levels. And at this point of hyperkalemia, dialysis is going to be required. With acid-base balance, in terms of early renal insufficiency, your acid excretion and bicarb reabsorption are going to be increased. And this is going to help maintain the normal pH. So it's trying to compensate, but it does put a patient into a state of me metabolic acidosis at around a GFR of 30 to 40%. We're also going to see changes in the bone and skeletal system. Because of the alterations in calcium and phosphate metabolism in our body with CKD, and these changes are going to start happening when the GFR decreases to 25% or less. Hypocalcemia or low calcium is going to be accelerated by the impaired renal synthesis of 1,25-dihydroxyvitamin D3, or we call this D3, or we call it calcitriol. And this is also going to be accompanied by a decreased intestinal ability to absorb our calcium. We will see phosphate excretion decreasing at the kidneys, and the increase of serum phosphate then is going to bind to the calcium. This will further contribute to the hypocalcemia because now we have phosphate binding to the free calcium. The acidosis that is occurring will also contribute to the negative calcium imbalance, and we'll see that there could be secondary hyperparathyroidism happening. And this is because the parathyroid hormone is on a feedback mechanism, a biofeedback mechanism. When our body detects that there's low calcium, the parathyroid hormone is going to secrete and it's going to mobilize and move all the calcium that's in our bone to help increase the calcium levels to make them normal. But if it does that, in addition to having a vitamin D deficiency, we can cause renal osteodystrophies, which is just a way of saying that we are more prone to having osteomalacia or any condition that would increase the risk for fractures and bone damage in our patients. We're also going to have vascular calcification that includes coronary artery calcification. And because there's fractional excretion of magnesium that takes place in CKD, so what that means is magnesium will increase, it's going to cause CKD to progress and contribute to further cardiovascular complications as well. So now our kidneys are affecting our heart. With protein, carbs, and fat metabolism, these are all going to be altered as well. Well, first we'll talk about proteinuria, and we know that levels of serum proteins, as they diminish, including, and importantly, albumin, but also complement and transferrin, we're also going to see a loss of muscle mass. With proteinuria, it can be independent and the cause of renal damage by promoting tubular inflammation and fibrosis. The amount of proteinuria is also important, and it's something that we can use to measure and monitor our patient's CKD. Monitoring proteinuria, specifically the albumin to creatinine ratio, can help us with staging chronic kidney disease in conjunction with GFR. Did you know that we also have hyperinsulinemia 
and glucose intolerance. And this is related to insulin resistance, which is common because of the related alterations that are occurring that interfere with the insulin action and oxidative stress. These all contribute to renal tubular and vascular injury. And this happens with both our diabetic patients, but it can affect our non-diabetic patients with CKD as well. And then we have hyperparathyroidism because of our low calcium. Well, this actually will decrease insulin sensitivity, impairing glucose tolerance. Dyslipidemia is also common. We will have a high ratio of LDLs to HDLs. LDLs are our low density lipoproteins and HDLs are our high density lipoproteins. Our patients may also have high levels of triglycerides and they may accumulate LDL particles, which will then accelerate atherosclerosis in their blood vessels. This may cause vascular calcification. Additionally, because our patients are already in a state of uremia as well, it can cause deficiency in the lipoprotein lipase and decrease hepatic triglyceride lipase. This decrease in lipolytic activity will then result in an overall reduction of HDLs, and HDLs are our good cholesterols. You can see that CKD impairs the metabolism and the protective effects of HDL as well. There are some hemolytic alterations that include normal chromic normocytic anemia. We will also see impaired platelet function, hypercoagulability, and this inadequate production of erythropoietin will ultimately decrease our RBCs. Our RBC production will be decreased, and it is the most significant factor in contributing anemia. We'll see chronic inflammation, iron deficiency, and decreased half-life of the erythrocytes. These are all contributing factors. Anemia contributes to decreased tissue oxygenation, so therefore we're going to have further progression of kidney disease because we have less perfusion. The low levels of hemoglobin, and now our patients are going to have symptoms of anemia, like lethargy, weakness, dizziness. These are all common findings at this stage. We treat the anemia by providing erythropoietin stimulant agents or we can give intravenous iron. So you can see now that the alterations of our body because of CKD are extensive and they are multi-system. This picture here shows all the different signs and symptoms and manifestations that you might encounter with your kidney failure patient. I do want to spend a little bit of time talking about the cardiovascular system for a second. This is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in our patients with CKD. The pro-inflammatory mediators, oxidative stress, the altered vitamin D metabolism, and other metabolic derangements significantly contribute to cardiovascular disease. Remember from the last slide, we're going to have declining erythropoietin production, which causes anemia, which then reduces oxygen delivery, and it affects the heart because it has an effect of less perfusion to the myocardium. Well, in relationship to that, we'll have elevated renin levels, which will stimulate aldosterone to be secreted. When we stimulate aldosterone, what comes forth from that? Our sodium and water reabsorption. Well, hypertension then is a result of this excess sodium and fluid volume. We also have dyslipidemia, which we talked about, and this can occur in the early stages of CKD as well. Arterial wall thickening helps to increase the, and decrease with the elastic fibers and increase extracellular matrix. We also will have plaque buildup and calcification in the arteries, and this leads to a loss of vessel elasticity. It can also lead to further damage like obstruction and can accelerate the oxidative stress that already is occurring with chronic kidney disease. On a macrovascular level, we're gonna have diseases that are responsible for increased risk for ischemic heart disease, like left ventricular hypertrophy or congestive heart failure. It puts our patients at risk for stroke, 
peripheral vascular disease, especially in patients with uremia. It will also affect the endothelial cell dysfunction and cause calcium deposits to um, be put in, causing a loss of vessel elasticity and vascular calcification. The result of this is going to put our patient at risk for ischemic heart disease. In terms of the pulmonary system, pulmonary edema results from the fluid overload and the congestive heart failure from the cardiovascular system. And dyspnea is going to be very common in end-stage chronic uh, kidney disease. We'll also have metabolic acidosis, and we're going to see Kussmaul respirations in result of that. The hematological system we touched upon briefly on the previous slide. Again, we're going to have normal chromic, normal cytic anemia, impaired platelet function, and hypercoagulability. So we have to look for signs and symptoms of anemia and signs and symptoms of hypercoagulability and difficulty with platelet aggregation. Disorders of hemostasis and CKD are the primarily related to defective platelet aggregation, impaired adhesion of platelets to the vascular endothelium, and there's going to be alterations in the coagulation factors within the fibrinolytic pathway that causes a blood clot. So your patient may be at increased risk of bleeding, and more commonly, it's going to happen at the end stages of CKD. You might see bruising, epistasis, mucosal bleeding, GI bleed, uh, even a cerebral vascular hemorrhage. It puts our patient at risk for excessive formation of thrombi, like deep vein thrombosis, pulmonary embolism, and it can cause them to have other cardiovascular events. In terms of the immune system, we will have dysregulation with immune suppression. We have deficiency in the response to certain vaccinations, intestinal barrier dysfunction, will have increased risk for infection that develops with CKD overall because our immune responses are suppressed. Malnutrition, metabolic acidosis, hyperglycemia, these all will um, be manifestations and we're going to see effects of hemodialysis that are going to further amplify immunosuppression because we're going to need hemodialysis to treat this late stage kidney disease. In terms of neurologic symptoms, these are very common with progressive CKD, and they're going to be related to lower motor and sensory neurons, so mostly associated with a patient that is undergoing uremic toxicity. If someone has chronic hyperkalemic depolarization and anemia, they're more likely to have neurologic symptoms. And so things that you might see are hiccups, muscle cramps, muscle twitching, in the advanced stages, it may progress to severe seizures and coma. Our patients will also complain about peripheral neuropathies, and this has to do with the development of impaired sensation. You might see decreased tendon reflexes, more muscle weakness and atrophy. Most commonly, you're gonna see this in the lower extremities um, than the upper extremities. Other symptoms include headache, drowsiness, sleep disorders, difficulty concentrating, difficulty with their memory, impaired judgment. We call this uremic encephalopathy. And eventually, if there is diabetes as a component, diabetic neuropathy can incur uh, concurrently to the other neurological symptoms with CKD. At this point, the only thing that can help is renal replacement therapy or kidney transplant. With the GI system, we have complications as well. We have what's called uremic gastroenteritis, and this can cause a bleeding ulcer and GI bleed significantly. We'll see nonspecific signs like um, nausea, vomiting, constipation, diarrhea, anorexia, or loss of appetite. Uremic fetter, this is a form of bad breath, and it's caused by the breakdown of urea in our salivary um, glands and in the enzymes. Malnutrition of our patients with CKD is also very common. The endocrine and reproductive systems are also altered during CKD progression. Males and females have a decreased level of the circulating sex steroid hormones. Males often experience a reduction in testosterone levels and they could also lead to impotence. 
We also have, in females, reduced estrogen levels and a loss of um, menstruation or amenorrhea. And they will have difficulty with conception and maintaining a term pregnancy. In both males and females, there may be a decrease in libido as well. Again, renal replacement therapy and kidney transplant can improve the sexual dysfunction symptoms. Insulin resistance, we know, is also common in our CKD patients, but specifically in states of uremia. Low-grade systemic inflammation, oxidative stress, vitamin D deficiency, and anemia are all contributing factors that increase our risk for cardiovascular disease, which then can retrograde into pulmonary disease, and now you've kind of seen how it can spread throughout the body. In terms of insulin, though, as CKD progresses, the ability of kidneys to clear the um, byproducts and degrade insulin is reduced. So the half-life of insulin is prolonged. So individuals with diabetes and CKD, they have to watch their insulin dosages. Okay, you may have to change it based on the half-life. Low protein diets and renal replacement therapy can improve insulin sensitivity. CKD also causes thyroid hormone metabolism alterations leading to low thyroid hormone levels and so they may have what we call a non-thyroidal illness syndrome or euthyroid sick syndrome and this will increase your risk for cardiovascular disease as well. Low-grade inflammation, oxidative stress, these are all contributing factors. Really, uremia reduces the conversion of T3 to T4 in your thyroid um, hormone levels. And lastly, how does it affect the integument system? We're going to see some skin changes and other complications that will develop with our patients with CKD. The anemia is going to cause a pallor and bleeding in the skin because of the hypercoagulability and the platelet dysfunction. We're, we might even see purpura and they'll be at higher risk for bruising. We'll see uh, hematomas and ecchymosis. Retained urochromes will also manifest as a very sallow skin color. It really just looks abnormal. Hyperparathyroidism and uremia will also cause residues on the skin. The calcium and phosphorus levels will also cause changes in your skin and there'll be alterations in the opioid receptors and this is associated with more irritation. You'll have puritis and it feels like they're just itchy all the time so then now they're scratching leaving excoriation which means they're going to be at increased risk for um, open um, wounds and lesions. There are so going to be an increased risk for infection, impaired sleep, and depression. So now you see that this, again, CKD can be a multi-system disease process. Be able to recognize how it affects every system and every organ.